The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Book First, Chapter Five. Quasimodo. In the twinkling of an eye, all was ready to execute Coppenol's idea. Bourgeois, scholars, and law clerks all set to work. The little chapel situated opposite the marble table was selected for the scene of the grinning match. A pane broken in the pretty rose window above the door left free a circle of stone through which it was agreed that the competitor should thrust their heads. In order to reach it, it was only necessary to mount upon a couple of hogsheads, which had been produced from I know not where, and perched one upon the other after a fashion. It was settled that each candidate, man or woman, for it was possible to choose a female pope, should, for the sake of leaving the impression of his grimace fresh and complete, cover his face and remain concealed in the chapel until the moment of his appearance. In less than an instant the chapel was crowded with competitors, upon whom the door was then closed. Capanol, from his post, ordered all, directed all, arranged all. During the uproar the cardinal, no less abashed than Gringoire, had retired with all his suite, under the pretext of business and vespers, without the crowd which his arrival had so deeply stirred being in the least moved by his departure. Guillaume Rhyme was the only one who noticed his eminence's discomfiture. The attention of the populace, like the sun, pursued its revolution. Having set out from one end of the hall, and halted for a space in the middle, it had now reached the other end. The marble table, the brocaded gallery, had each had their day. It was now the turn of the chapel of Louis the Eleventh. Henceforth the field was open to all folly. There was no one there now but the Flemings and the rabble. The grimaces began. The first face which appeared at the aperture, with eyelids turned up to the reds, a mouth open like a maw, and a brow wrinkled like our hussar boots of the empire, evoked such an inextinguishable peal of laughter that Homer would have taken all these louts for gods. Nevertheless, the grand hall was anything but Olympus, and Gringoire's poor Jupiter knew it better than anyone else. A second and third grimace followed, then another and another and the laughter and transports of delight went on increasing. There was, in this spectacle, a peculiar power of intoxication and fascination, of which it would be difficult to convey to the reader of our day and our salons any idea. Let the reader picture to himself a series of visages presenting successfully all geometric forms, from the triangle to the trapezium, from the cone to the polyhedron, all human expressions, from wrath to lewdness, all ages, from the wrinkles of the newborn babe to the wrinkles of the aged and dying, all religious phantasmagories, from fawn to Beelzebub, all animal profiles, from the maw to the beak, from the jowl to the muzzle. Let the reader imagine all these grotesque figures of the Pont Neuf whose nightmares petrified beneath the hand of Germain Pilon, assuming life and breath, and coming in to stare at you in the face with burning eyes, all the masks of the Carnival of Venice passing in succession before your glass, in a word, a human kaleidoscope. The orgy grew more and more Flemish. Ten years could have given but a very imperfect idea of it. Let the reader picture to himself, in bacchanal form, Salvatore Rosa's battle. There were no longer either scholars or ambassadors or bourgeois or men or women. There was no longer any Clopin Truffaut or Gilles Lecornu or Marie Quatrelivres or Robin Pospin. All was universal license. The Grand Hall was no longer anything but a vast furnace of effrontery and joviality, where every mouth was a cry, every individual a posture everything shouted and howled. The strange visages which came in turn to gnash their teeth in the rose window were like so many brands cast into the brazier, and from the whole of this effervescing crowd there escaped, as from a furnace, a sharp, piercing, stinging noise, hissing like the wings of a gnat. Ho, oh, eh, hey, curse it! Just look at that face! It's not good for anything!' 
Goya met Mojer Puy. Just look at that bull's muzzle. It only lacks the horns. It can't be your husband. Another! Belly of the Pope! What sort of a grimace is that? Hola, eh! That's cheating! One must show only one's face! That damned Perrette Calabot! She's capable of that! Good! Good! I'm stifling! There's a fellow whose ears won't go through! Etc., etc. But we must do justice to our friend Jehan. In the midst of this witch's Sabbath, he was still to be seen on the top of his pillar, like the cabin boy on the topmast. He floundered about with incredible fury. His mouth was wide open, and from it there escaped a cry which no one heard, not that it was covered by the general clamor, great as that was, but because it attained, no doubt, the limit of perceptible sharp sounds, the thousand vibrations of Savure, or the eight thousands of Biot. As for Gringoire, the first moment of depression having passed, he had regained his composure. He had hardened himself against adversity. "'Continue!' he had said for the third time to his comedians, speaking machines. Then, as he was marching with great strides in front of the marble table, a fancy seized him to go and appear in his turn at the aperture of the chapel were it only for the pleasure of making a grimace at that ungrateful populace. But no, that would not be worthy of us. No vengeance. Let us combat until the end, he repeated to himself. The power of poetry over people is great. I will bring them back. We shall see which will carry the day, grimaces or polite literature. Alas! he had been left the sole spectator of his piece. It was far worse than it had been a little while before. He no longer beheld anything but backs. I am mistaken. The big patient man, whom he had already consulted in a critical moment, had remained with his face turned towards the stage. As for Gisquette and Leonard, they had deserted him long ago. Gringoire was touched to the heart by the fidelity of his only spectator. He approached him and addressed him, shaking his arm slightly, for the good man was leaning on the balustrade and dozing a little. Monsieur, said Gringoire, I thank you. Monsieur, replied the big man with a yawn, for what? I see what wearies you, resumed the poet. Tis all this noise which prevents your hearing comfortably. But be at ease. Your name shall descend to posterity. Your name, if you please? Renaud Chateau, guardian of the seals of the Châtelet of Paris, at your service. Monsieur, you are the only representative of the muses here, said Gringoire. You are too kind, sir, said the guardian of the seals at the Châtelet. You are the only one, resumed Gringoire, who has listened to the piece decorously. What do you think of it? Eh, eh, replied the fat magistrate, half aroused. It's tolerably jolly, that's a fact. Gringoire was forced to content himself with this eulogy, for a thunder of applause, mingled with a prodigious acclamation, cut their conversation short. The Pope of the Fools had been elected. Noel! 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 shouted the people on all sides. That was, in fact, a marvellous grimace which was beaming at that moment through the aperture in the rose window. After all the pentagonal, hexagonal, and whimsical faces which had succeeded each other at the whole without realizing the ideal of the grotesque which their imaginations, excited by the orgy, had constructed, nothing less was needed to win their suffrages than the sublime grimace which had just dazzled the assembly. Master Caponol himself applauded and Clopin Trifot, who had been among the competitors, and God knows what intensity of ugliness his visage could attain, confessed himself conquered. We will do the same. We shall not try to give the reader an idea of that tetrahedral nose, that horseshoe mouth, that little left eye obstructed with a red, bushy, bristling eyebrow, while the right eye disappeared entirely beneath an enormous wart, of those teeth in disarray 
broken here and there like the embattled parapet of a fortress, of that callous lip upon which one of those teeth encroached, like the tusk of an elephant, of that forked chin, and above all, of the expression spread over the whole, of that mixture of malice, amazement, and sadness. Let the reader dream of this whole if he can. The acclamation was unanimous. People rushed towards the chapel. They made the lucky Pope of the Fools come forth in triumph. But it was then that surprise and admiration attained their highest pitch. The grimace was his face. Or rather, his whole person was a grimace. A huge head, bristling with red hair, between his shoulders an enormous hump, a counterpart perceptible in front, a system of thighs and legs so strangely astray that they could touch each other only at the knees, and viewed from the front resembled the crescents of two scythes joined by the handles, large feet, monstrous hands, and with all this deformity an indescribable and redoubtable air of vigor, agility, and courage, strange exception to the eternal rule which wills that force as well as beauty shall be the result of harmony. Such was the Pope whom the fools had just chosen for themselves. One would have pronounced him a giant who had been broken and badly put together again. When this species of Cyclops appeared on the threshold of the chapel, motionless, squat, and almost as broad as he was tall, squared on the base as a great man says, with his doublet half-red, half-violet, sewn with silver bells, and above all, in the perfection of his ugliness, the populace recognized him on the instant, and shouted with one voice, "'Tis Quasimodo, the bell-ringer! Tis Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame! Quasimodo, the one-eyed! Quasimodo, the bandy-legged! Noel! Noel!" It will be seen that the poor fellow had a choice of surnames. "'Let the women with child beware!' shouted the scholars. "'Or those who wish to be!' resumed Joanne. The women did, in fact, hide their faces. "'Oh, the horrible monkey!' said one of them. "'As wicked as he is ugly!' retorted another. "'He is the devil!' added a third. "'I have the misfortune to live near Notre Dame. I hear him prowling round the eaves by night.' with the cats. He's always on our roofs. He throws spells down our chimneys. The other evening he came and made a grimace at me through my attic window. I thought that it was a man, such a fright as I had. I'm sure that he goes to the witch's Sabbath. Once he left a broom on my leads. Oh, what a displeasing hunchback's face! Oh, what an ill-favored soul! you!" The men, on the contrary, were delighted and applauded. Quasimodo, the object of the tumult, still stood on the threshold of the chapel, somber and grave, and allowed them to admire him. One scholar, Robin Puispan, I think, came and laughed in his face, and too close. Quasimodo contented himself with taking him by the girdle and hurling him ten paces off amid the crowd all without uttering a word. Master Caponol, in amazement, approached him. "'Cross of God! Holy Father! You possess the handsomest ugliness that I have ever beheld in my life! You would deserve to be Pope at Rome, as well as at Paris!' So saying, he placed his hand gaily on his shoulder. Quasimodo did not stir. Caponol went on. You are a rogue with whom I have a fancy for carousing, were it to cost me a new dozen of twelve livres of tours. How does it strike you? Quasimodo made no reply. Cross of God, said the hosier, are you deaf? He was, in truth, deaf. Nevertheless, he began to grow impatient with Campanol's behavior, and suddenly turned towards him, with so formidable a gnashing of teeth, that the Flemish giant recoiled, like a bulldog before a cat. Then there was created around that strange personage a circle of terror and respect, 
whose radius was at least fifteen geometrical feet. An old woman explained to Campanol that Quasimodo was deaf. Deaf! said the hosier, with his great Flemish laugh. Cross of God! He's a perfect pope! He! I recognize him! exclaimed Jehan, who had at last descended from his capital in order to see Quasimodo at closer quarters. He's the bell ringer of my brother, the archdeacon. Good day, Quasimodo! What a devil of a man! said Robin Pouspin, still all bruised with his fall. He shows himself. He's a hunchback. He walks. He's bandy-legged. He looks at you. He's one-eyed. You speak to him. He's deaf. And what does this Polyphemus do with his tongue? He speaks when he chooses, said the old woman. He became deaf through ringing the bells. He is not dumb. That he lacks, remarks Jehan. And he has one eye too many, added Robin Pouspin. Not at all, said Jehan wisely. A one-eyed man is far less complete than a blind man. He knows what he lacks. In the meantime all the beggars, all the lackeys, all the cut-purses, joined with the scholars, had gone in procession to seek, in the cupboard of the law-clerk's company, the cardboard tiara, and the derisive robe of the Pope of Fools. Quasimodo allowed them to array him in them without wincing, and with a sort of proud docility. Then they made him seat himself on a motley litter. Twelve officers of the Fraternity of Fools raised him on their shoulders, and a sort of bitter and disdainful joy lighted up the morose face of the Cyclops, when he beheld beneath his deformed feet all those heads of the handsome, straight, well-made men. Then the ragged and howling procession set out on its march, according to custom, around the inner galleries of the courts, before making the circuit of the streets and squares. End of chapter 5